Hi there. Okay, so what uh, we'll both do is just give you a little overview as to our background. It's always nice to know um, who's presenting. So, first of all, myself. Um, I have an undergraduate um, degree in electronic and electrical engineering from the University of uh, Glasgow. And after graduating in 2007, I uh, worked in the robotics industry uh, for the forge and foundry industry, and in particular designing control instrumentation systems uh, as well as commissioning these systems on sites uh, throughout the world. Joined NEL um, in 2009 and transferring that skill set of control and instrumentation over, I've been spent the past uh, 10 years designing and building, commissioning the National Flow Labs, control and instrumentation and software tools. And in the past two years, I've now been heading up um, the digital services research groups. So we're looking at data analytics of big data, uh, condition-based monitoring, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, recently, I've also uh, completed a part-time engineering doctorate degree, with, uh, which was um, done in collaboration with Coventry University, and that looked at uh, uh, Coriolis flow metering and ambient temperature effects on Coriolis flow metering. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, over to you, Yang Feng. Hello, everyone. So I'm Yang Feng. I'm a mathematician within the company. So I got my so my, life, my background is on mathematical modeling. I got my PhD from the University of Strathclyde in 2016, where my research area was on mathematical modeling and the spread of infectious disease. So after that, I did a three years postdoc on a, working on a collaboration project between the University of Strathclyde as well as some uh, industry researchers and government bodies based in Malaysia, and working to use mathematical modeling to combat a public health issue that's been troubling the Malaysians for many years. So now I am in the company looking at um, continuing to use the mathematical model as well as machine learning models to analyze the data that's outputting by flow meters to get a better understanding on the performance and the conditions of flow meters and ultimately to enable condition-based monitoring. So I will now, so this is a little background about myself, so I will now pass it back to Dr. Lindsay who will begin today's webinar. Okay, so... Uh, I'm so the outline for uh, today's presentation is we're going to be talking about digitalization um, and condition-based monitoring. I'll give you a, a brief overview um, of some of the buzzwords and how um, what exactly National Engineering Laboratory are doing in this area. Um, I'll then talk to you about uh, digital networks and uh, our specific experiences around digital networks and the infrastructure required that basically will enable condition-based monitoring. Um, I'll then give a, a small example on calibration and data synchronization um, and um, Jan Feng will also uh, be talking to you about statistical modeling and machine learning, and again, provide a couple of case studies which hopefully you'll find interesting. So, moving on into the uh, first section then. Digitalization is one of the many uh, buzzwords that are around these days, and as well as Internet of Things, Industry 4.0, Artificial Intelligence, Digital Strategy, and Digital Journey, which is one of my personal favorites. Um, all encompasses uh, the same thing, and, and just um, by way of example, this is um, two suits, um, our parent company's um, trends and challenges um, uh, post. And of course, about digital technologies is one of the one of the highlights there. But it's always useful when giving these kind of presentations. These these things mean very different things to different companies, to different industry sectors. So from our perspective, and what we'll be presenting on today, we'll uh, translate that into. Um, integrating digital technologies themselves, so we're talking about networks, digital field bus, uh, digital data from sensors and data loggers, and then how do we actually analyze uh, those large data sets? What kind of data are we looking at? Are we looking at historical data? Are we looking at live data? There are different considerations there. And then, of course, there's automation as well, so um, things like process control, instrumentation, uh, automating physical processes, as well as automating data analysis, and, and even things like maintenance and, scout and staff uh, scheduling. These can all be um, achieved through digitalization, um, and for us um, as a company as a whole, these are the three key areas that we are looking at um, in, some, in some way or, or another. I sometimes find it easier to kind of look at it from this point of view, um, certainly as a National Measurement Institute. We're interested in uh, measurement and analysis, and also from my background, um, control as well. And for today's purposes, we're looking at condition-based monitoring, so we're really much crossing over between the the measurement and, and analysis uh, portion here. So there has been considerable investment in automating decision making and processes across multiple industry sectors. We are of course coming at it from a flow measurement background, um, um, clean fuels as well as oil and gas. But this also extends to things like food technologies and the automotive industry. Um, 
But from the oil and gas industry, um, a lot of this t t tends to get grouped under um, digital oil field packages. And within digital oil field packages, you've got things like condition-based calibration, uh, well production, optimization, staff scheduling, and data analytics. So this is, again, just setting the scene. This is kind of the area that we'll be um, looking at and talking about um, today. This is certainly where um, our, our research team's interests lie. Of course, the idea is to replace the traditional time-based calibration, which everyone's very much familiar with, and it's certainly something that NEL um, supports on a daily basis. Um, of course, there's costs associated with time-based calibration. Uh, things like removing and uh, refitting meters to, to, to ship them off to a calibration lab will incur costs. Um, incorrect data output due to calibration drifts is going to incur costs, especially if a, a, an event or um, something occurs maybe a month after you've had your, your annual calibration, then you're going to have the rest of the year outputting incorrect data. There's going to be significant um, financial, financial penalties there um, if you're uh, involved in fiscal transfer. Uh, of course, calibration lab fees themselves um, aren't cheap, and then of course the shipping. So all these things, all these costs are associated with time-based um, calibration are things that hopefully moving to more dynamic um, methods um, uh, can, can help with. And of course, if you look at this picture here, which is actually a picture of our new advanced multiphase facility, you can imagine the kind of complexities of, a, of a, something that may be 10 times the size of this on, the, on, a, on an oil platform, and the disruption that removing a, a valve or a, or a meter can have and the amount of downtime and, and staff that's required to do that. So certainly moving away from this type of system and, and looking at something more dynamic is, is within a lot of um, operators' interests. And that's where condition-based calibration comes in. If you can make the, the, the maintenance and the fault diagnosis um, more dynamic, um, that's, um, that's going to reduce these, a lot of these costs which are associated with uh, time-based calibration. This can only be possible if you've got enough knowledge of your system. So condition-based calibration systems require the engineering knowledge and expertise of people who actually work in specific facilities. It's a program into the knowledge um, that, that, go, um, that these packages very much rely on. So um, in terms of specifying and commissioning these systems, it's vital that whoever um, has been involved in these facilities the longest are part of that process. That's not to say there aren't costs associated with condition-based calibration. Um, there, there, there are, of course, costs associated with the, the technology itself. When you're implementing intelligent diagnostics, you're invariably going to be um, buying more expensive hardware. Um, implementing digital networks themselves have hardware costs, but also commissioning costs and um, definitely, from our experience, um, maintenance um, costs and understanding. Staff training, you're moving away from a, a system where, um, which is well understood. It might be a, a, a basic analog system with basic 4 to 20 milliamp, 0 to 10 volt signals from each device. You're now looking at things like OPC networks and servers. So it's important that if staff are going to be using these systems, that they're trained to a level of competence where they can actually interpret the data and get useful information out of it. Because that's where, if you have incorrect interpretation of the data, then that's, that, that's, and you've always got a more inefficient system than the previous time-based calibration system. You'll be making decisions based on data that's not well understood. When it comes to full metering, um, Many oil and gas organizations um, have invested in upgrading their, their legacy devices, um, so, and not just your, your primary flow devices, but also your secondary devices. So pressure transmitters and temperature transmitters um, all have fuel bus equivalents. And certainly we as the national standards, certainly the past 10 years that I've been working here, that's been one of our um, main goals, is to replace wherever possible an old analog device with a digital device. Um, but this can actually be challenging um, for flow meter calibration labs. So if um, the people who are actually sending devices to us for calibration, if they're now changing to much more um, um, varied um, digital technologies, um, we, uh, we need to make sure that we can actually calibrate and connect to these devices and get the data off of them. So we need to be, 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 be aware of that as a, as a laboratory that's servicing multiple industry sectors. So not only do we now have to support uh, multiple metering technologies and multiple manufacturers within those metering technologies, but we also have to be able to support multiple comms networks, and we have to be able to um, switch between these seamlessly um, and reduce setup time wherever possible. And that's where um, a lot of my work's been focused in the past um, 10 years is, is, is coding in drivers and coding in processes uh, which don't require detailed knowledge of how these infrastructures actually work, um, but also how they, um, they can actually be implemented um, by, by, by staff who maybe uh, haven't set them up for just merely using them. Moving on to looking at digital networks themselves. Um, this is uh, for those of you um, who have never been to the National Engineering Laboratory or haven't seen a picture. This is our James Young calibration facility. And we've got multiple um, labs um, and, and, and single phase, multi phase calibration facilities here. We've got single phase oil, single phase water, we've got a multi phase separator there. These are our gravimetric calibration 
tanks. So that just gives, uh, puts things in context a wee bit. But it, you can, it's, a, it's a fairly large building, multiple sensors, and of course you're only seeing half of um, the facility. This is the, the nice uh, um, clean half and, and for the, the customers and researchers to see. There's of course a basement level where we've got our heat exchangers and our pumps and a lot of our control actually happens down, down in the basement. So a lot of sensors, a lot of networks, all um, having to work seamlessly um, across multiple facilities. Um, and all that data, um, some of that data is shared between the oil and the water facility and the multi-phase facility, things like uh, lab ambient um, temperatures and pressures, etc. So not, um, not a simple um, case um, to, be, to be setting up these kind of facilities. Digital networks themselves, you, can, you of course get multiple variants of digital networks, um, and those of you who are listening in today, I imagine you'll have some um, interest or awareness of it, so I won't um, go too in, in, in depth on this, but of course you've got the, the classics that we certainly encounter are Foundation Field Bus, uh, Prop Bus, or Prop Net, Net, and Mod Bus. Of course, each, one, each of these um, networks also have their own protocol specific hardware, which of course have cost considerations and software considerations. So again, as, since we're a lab that are now having to support all uh, three types of these, these networks, um, when we were first initially setting them up, and, and we were incurring uh, quite large costs in, in terms of um, buying in the correct hardware, testing it, writing drivers for our software, which of course we develop in-house as well. Um, so certainly when we were first exploring this, we, we moved to using, as many people do, um, OPC, Open Platform Communications. This is a, a way of allowing free flow of data, which is essentially protocol dependent. It sits on top of these um, these networks and allows um, information that's been logged over Foundation Field Bus and information that's been logged over Profit Bus to be, to be exchanged between different systems. So it's a very, very useful um, tool uh, which many people use in industry today. And also, um, it means we don't have to write um, device and protocol specific drivers. We can um, target the OPC layer instead, which makes things a lot more efficient. Um, in fact, most facilities um, these days have a mix of protocols, um, certainly in the autom automation industry. Um, I've visited a few food and drinks factories in my time, and generally what happens is you'll have a facility which has adopted foundation fuel bus transmitters because five years ago they had an upgrade um, process where they brought in foundation fuel bus fresh transmitters, and then five years later there was another upgrade process, but instead of buying foundation fuel bus, they bought mod bus devices. So it, it's not too uncommon for, for facilities to have a mix of protocols, but it, when it comes to a calibration facility, because we are setting up a new job every day from scratch, that's when the challenge comes. Um, a lot of um, process facilities will set up their network and leave it running for five years and, and not worry about it. It's when you're actively making changes to these networks and these systems on a daily basis that things get quite challenging, and that's when you have to um, take into account staff training and um, more intuitive software in setting up these kind of networks. And that's just a, a, a general overview. For those who aren't familiar with OPC, um, this is a, a simplified version of what we have in our facilities here. So, for instance, um, if you look, we look at the bottom here, you may have a Coriolis uh, meter installed in our test facility, which outputs over Modbus. Our PLCs, our programmable logic controllers, which do a lot of the control in um, our facilities, we, we, communicate, we use Siemens to, um, uh, PLCs, which um, um, largely communicate over Profibus or Profinet. And as I say, fresh transmitters may be outputting over Foundation Field Bus. Three different protocols all get uploaded to the OPC server. And in our data analytics package, um, which in our case is either NELDAC or Flow Studio, both uh, two bits of software which were developed in-house, um, they can pull this OPC server and, and grab the data from these three different networks without the, the, the software or the operator really having to uh, know what's happening at this layer. So it's a very useful um, model to use. So essentially what I'm trying to get across um, before we actually get into the modeling and the, the, the data analysis is before you actually um, can get to that, you have to um, go away of the setup. So what we're doing is we're moving away from the traditional analog setup where you used to have individual wires um, per device. So yet each valve in the facility would have an individual 0 to 10 volt control signal and an individual 4 to 20 milliamp feedback signal. Um, and of course, pressure transmitters and temperature transmitters each having their own individual wire, which of course can be bulky in terms of the physical um, amount of cables that you've got in a large facility. Um, also, um, in terms of fault diagnosis, uh, traditional analog systems, it can be, it can be quite time-consuming to, to diagnose um, electrical faults. But of course, it is, it is basic electronics, so while it's, it can be time-consuming and physically take up a lot of space, it's better understood. So again, you've got this balance of um, analog giving you advantages and disadvantages. Of course, um, a lot of facilities these days, NEL and 
Others are moving to an analog digital hybrid where you're still supporting analog devices. We certainly, as a calibration lab, have to continue to support analog devices because they're not going anywhere anytime soon. A lot of these devices that were manufactured 10, 20 years ago are built to last. So therefore, we're still going to be seeing them for years to come. So we have to maintain our analog infrastructure while adopting digital infrastructure wherever possible to um, meet, meet the needs of um, new devices which are coming into calibration and research, but also to increase the efficiency of our own facilities. So for example, our multi-phase facility um, no longer has individual wires to our valve. We run our valves off of a ASI network as actuator into the interface. And that reduces your cable lens and also reduces diagnosis, diagnosis for faults because you, instead of having to go through individual wires, we, each device has an individual address and you can target that um, digitally. So that's a much more efficient way of doing things. And as I say, we've still got our analog devices where, where necessary and we're um, supporting digital um, and analog pressure and temperature transmitters. All that information can be transferred over an OPC server client setup. So our HMIs, our SCADA systems, and our data acquisition software can transfer um, information between each other, which means um, overall we can get larger data sets, which are um, very helpful in terms of the stuff that um, Yang Feng is going to be talking to you about. Um, and it helps us better understand our facility performance as well as um, on an individual test or calibration research project basis. And just to put that into context, um, this is an example of um, the overall of our multi-phase uh, flows and the comms infrastructure. So um, just we've got, as I say, pocket bus for our PLCs, um, ASI for our valves. We also have wireless heart for some of the newer devices, um, digital field bus and analog, all um, getting logged by our SCADA and our um, diagnostics analytics packages for so our DAC softwares. And, and that can give you an overview of um, how it's going to spread out through our facilities, through our pumps and profit bus, um, some of our press transmitters on analog, um, et cetera. And some of that, some of that in interconnection isn't actually done in software. Some of it can be done in OPC, but some of it you do need um, device couplers. So in this, in this case here, we've got our ASI networks for our valves go through uh, device couplers and gateways, which then get uploaded onto the profit bus network and can talk via profit net back to our PLC. So again, a lot of what, what I'm trying to get across with this is there's a lot of planning is required, a lot of um, understanding as to what devices and what in infrastructures can communicate with each other. But overall, um, I've worked here for 10 years and I very much enjoy doing this kind of work. It's very rewarding when you get these things working um, at the scale that, that, we're, that we're working with. But when you actually start to consider uh, condition-based calibration, there are other variables to consider uh, going beyond the physical hardware and the, and the, the, the state infrastructures. Uh, to fully realize a condition-based calibration system, especially in a flow calibration uh, laboratory, you've got to consider things like fluid properties, uh, flow rates, and meter and type geometries. These, these are all um, parameters which, which can affect a condition-based calibration system and must be known and understood by the engineers when, when setting up and um, tuning a system. Uh, even the different operating principles between flow metering technologies can, of course, um, affect that. And, and, of course, you've then got variations within manufacturer variants. So, for instance, uh, two different types of Coriolis meter from different manufacturers will work on the same principles, so it may give out different outputs, which the condition-based calibration system is going to be logging. And then, you've, of course, even differences in data acquisition methods can all, can all affect the reliability and, of a condition-based calibration system and how well that is understood. And finally, for me, before I hand over to Yang Fen, just a, a quick example of uh, calibration and data synchronization, um, which is an interesting topic. So we're talking through our, our single-phase water facility and, and a gravimetric calibration and differences between calibrating an analog um, flow meter versus a digital flow meter using the same system. So just to talk you through, and for those of you that aren't familiar with our facilities, we have uh, water which is kept in our storage tanks here. We have uh, pumps, which could be, this is a simplified diagram. In reality, the, the, the facilities are much more complicated than that. But in reality, so for the purposes of this example, we have pumps which can circulate um, the fluid through our own reference meters into the test section. This test section is where a flow meter will be installed. Water passes through the test meter and then goes into our gravimetric um, tank. This is a tank of known volume, and it's, um, it's mounted on a weighbridge. So you can either get a volumetric uh, calibration or a, or, or a gravimetric, a mass flow rate calibration, depending on uh, what type of meter you're using. And the principle is that whatever um, volume of liquid has passed through this meter should end up in this tank. It's a simple enough process. It's well understood. And it's been in op um, operation for about 20 years. But when you, when you 
you know, start to consider things like the data acquisition and implications and then condition-based calibration implications, there are certain things you need to consider. So for analog um, calibration, so a meter that's giving out a pulse or a frequency, be it a Coriolis meter uh, or a turbine meter, which has been installed in our, our test lines here, um, it will be, be outputting a, um, a pulse which goes through some analog signal conditioning. You, we in our facilities, we will remove any unwanted electrical noise. We also amplify the signal up to TTL, transistor transistor logic um, standards, uh, to allow our data acquisition hardware, which generally consists of pulse counters, um, that, will, will, that begin counting uh, pulses when the test starts from the, from, the, from the flow meter. But then, of course, you, got, you have to understand that you have to start your uh, counters um, when you're at steady state conditions. We're only interested in counting pulses from a flow meter which has um, got fluid passing through it, when this valve, or in this case, the diverter from the, from the waterway tank is in the open um, um, state, i.e. letting water pass into the tank. So we want to discount any fluids that's passed through the meter um, during the time when the diverter has been half open or half closed, or if it was in a valve, like our, our single phase oil facility, when the valve is um, half open or half closed. We're only interested in when the valve is fully open or fully closed. Um, so, um, so, so to summarize, essentially, when that diverter moves to the open position, um, a pulse counter um, is triggered using a, an individual gate. Pulse counter starts, the data acquisition starts logging, and then when the test is finished, that diverter moves across. Test is finished. Therefore, it sends another, a signal to that gate to say, like, stop, the, stop the counting. Pulse counter stops, and there, therefore you've got a good representation of the fluid that was collected during that time frame and the pulses that were counted during that time frame, and you can compare against the tank, and you've got a calibration. That's well understood. Um, throughout um, ADL and uh, those that visit us, and we're perfectly comfortable with that scenario. But what happens when you move to an old digital meter which isn't giving a pulse output or a frequency output? We're using the same facility, we're not changing any of the hardware, um, and all we're doing is we're lo now logging the, the flow meter from a, instead of a pulse, we've now got a digital output which gets uploaded to a digital network. As we said, that gets logged by an OPC server, and our data acquisition software pulls that OPC server to get the data. On the face of things, you wouldn't think there's a problem with that. But when you're dealing with fractions of a second, it takes that diverter to open and close. Compared to the refresh rates of a digital network and an OPC server, you're starting to introduce uncertainties into your system. You also have a disconnect. You know, this diverter gate signal, which is actually an opto switch, it's a five volt pulse, which gets sent to our data acquisition system, and when that diverter um, crosses it, that's now, there's now a disconnect between that system. So. Um, how do, you, how do you quantify that, that level of delay when you're no longer triggering pulse counting based on a, on a, a physical movement of a device? So you have to, you have to uh, consider how often is the OPC server pulling the device, how often is the OPC client or the DAC software pulling the server. Uh, network speeds are protocol dependent, so you have to keep, uh, consider that as well. Uh, what is the data output frequency from the device itself? And what is the physical lag between the, 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 the phenomena that's measuring uh, the flow rate? Uh, going into the meter firmware, and then outputting that data. So all these are potential points of delay, um, and it's something that should be considered when moving to an old digital meter that's to be calibrated on a, a laboratory which used to only calibrate analog um, devices. So it's an interesting uh, challenge, and I've been at oil and gas focus groups and other um, conferences recently. If any of you have been there, we may have had this, the same conversation, but this is a challenge which is facing not just um, uh, flow measurement, but multiple industry sectors, the automotive sector as well. It's how do you effectively synchronize uh, digital data and integrate it with an older analog system. Um, and there's certainly different ways to do that. GPS synchronization is certainly one that gets brought up quite a few times. Um, so it's an interesting topic um, with many, many possible solutions. Uh, what I'm going to do now is hand you over to Yang Feng, who's going to be uh, talking to you about uh, the more exciting modeling mm -hmm. stuff that the digital team are working on here. So over to you, Yang Feng. Thank you, Gordon. So for the remainder of the webinar, I'll be talking about different types of data-driven models that you can use. Um, to analyze the data outputting from flow meters and how we can go about using those models to enable condition-based monitoring. So to start off with, so as Gordon already mentioned that our flow meters is capable of outputting large amount of data and those data provide valuable information which tell us the condition and performance of our flow meters. So whenever we do have a, uh, problems, those sort of errors is often um, denoted by a drift in some of the diagnostic uh, parameters. However, we have the challenge that sometimes the different types of error can actually cause the same drift and the same diagnostic uh, variables, and because of that, 
whenever we do see those drugs, we can never predict with certainty, you know, exactly what's co what's what error is responsible for causing that drug. Is it because of error A? Is it because of error B? And because of that, it's sometimes not enough to just focus on one particular di one or two particular diagnostic variables and rely on those to, uh, to identify the types of error that's responsible for it. And as we are dealing with a large amount of data, without proper modeling techniques, sometimes it's very difficult to fully understand the correlation between different variables. And because of that, we decided to use data-driven models to analyze the relationship and the correlation between different variables. And from that, we can then get a better understanding on what exactly is the variable telling us. And from the data-driven model, we can also make future predictions, which will obviously help us in terms of decision-making and improve our efficiency. So I thought that would be a good idea before I go into too much detail on showing you the results from the case study, telling you exactly what do we mean by data-driven model, and just giving you some examples of different types of data-driven models you can use and the result you expect from them. So here is some examples. So the first example is what, what we call a regression model, which is probably one of the most well-known models in terms of uh, data modeling, uh, regardless of what industry you're from. So regression model can really take various different forms. The simplest one is probably a linear regression model, and then you can have more complicated ones, for example, long linear regression model or even a time series regression model. So this type of model is commonly used when you want to get a better understanding on the relationship between different variables. So in other words, do we have a simple linear relationship, just a straight line, or do we have something that's more complicated, for example, a polynomial or even a cubic M relationship? So by performing a regression model, you can actually see how the, the parameters on your y-axis changes with a change of the uh, unit in the parameters in your x-axis. So in other words, you can actually perform a sensitivity analysis to see the impact of changing variable on your output data. The next type of, uh, the next type of regression model you can look at is a time series model. So this is where you have um, parameters that's collected continuously over time. And based on the future, uh, sorry, based on the pre historical um, data as well as the previous pattern, you can make future prediction on what your interested variable is going to be like, say, in the next five minutes, ten minutes, or something even longer in days, weeks, or months. The next set of result, uh, sorry, next set of statistical models that you can use is a more advanced anomaly detection model. So imagine you have a large data set that's collected continuously over time and you want to use those data as a form of monitoring purpose to see whether there's been any particular time in place where we have uh, something strange happening with a particular data set, which then, then signifies to end users that, you know, maybe there's something um, wrong is happening at that particular point, which then can um, tell the end users to perform further investigation. So the principle behind the anomaly detection model is that when you feed in the model into the algorithm result, the algorithm will break the data down into different components, so namely the general trend of the data, any seasonality associated with the data, as well as any other random noises. So this type of algorithm is actually very useful when you're dealing with data that has lots of noise, because then if you have a very noisy data, sometimes it may be difficult to actually say whether we do have anomalies because it's hard to tell from the data. So by breaking the data into different components, then the algorithm will then look at each category and identify any particular point the algorithm believes that we have something weird going on here because it doesn't follow the regular pattern amongst the rest of data. Then at the end, it will produce a very simple graph to the end users, similar to the one that's illustrated on the left-hand side, which, where it tells the end user exactly which data point it thinks is anomalies, which in this case is denoted by the red dot. So these red dots is considered to be anomalies, and any normal regular ones are then denoted within the gray area. So one interesting aspect of this anomaly detection algorithm is that it provides a form of flexibility for end users in terms of how they want to classify something as anomalies. So in other words, there are features in that algorithm where you can actually control the bandwidth of this gray area, depending on, obviously, different users may have different uh, opinions or different rules in terms of um, how they define anomalies. So you can, decide, depend, you can decide how strict you want to be, essentially. So before I move on to show you some of the results that we obtained from two case studies where we used some um, machine learning models, I would just like to point out that all the simulations that's produced in this graph and the, uh, in this slide and the previous slides are actually obtained from real data. So these are the type of results you will actually expect to see when you're using a data-driven model in practice. 
So next, let's us look at this in more detail by looking at two case studies. So the first case study we want to look at is on our ultrasonic flow meters. So in this case, we are dealing with a classification model, which is an example of a machine learning algorithm. So this type of model is commonly used in decision-making process where we wish to predict the category of which data belongs in. So what do we mean by category? Well, category can really be anything. So it could literally be the types of error. Does your data represent a single phase foot or does it represent a multi-phase foot? Or it could literally be saying that, well, does our data represent a failing system or is that, does our data represent a system that's completely working fine? Or it could, it could even be something like different temperature level or different pressure level. So in our case, the key study that we want to do is to use the machine learning algorithm to predict the types of error that's experienced by the ultrasonic meters. Essentially speaking, the aim of this case study is want to address the challenge that I mentioned previously, where we do see a drift in the diagnostic variable, we can't really predict, you know, is it because of error A, is it because of error B? So that is what we try to address here by using a machine learning algorithm. So the two types of errors that we're interested here in this case study is different types of installation error. So what that means is that it could be like vertical misalignment of the flow meters or it could be a horizontal misalignment as well as having some wax filled up in some of the transducer supports in the ultrasonic meters. So let us now look at the results. So here are the res prediction results we obtained from our case study one from the machine learning algorithm. So the four sets of uh, simulations shown on your left-hand side represents the prediction result obtained from the different types of error, and the four sets of results shown on your right-hand side represents the prediction result showing uh, for wax filled up. So exactly what do they mean? So along the x-axis, we have different types of installation errors, so that's just horizontal misalignment, vertical misalignment. And on the y-axis, it's just probability going from 0 to 1. So to understand this result, let us look at this example. So what this is saying is that with a probability of 0 0.91, we managed to predict correctly the error that's responsible for causing the drifts that we experience in the diagnostic variable that we feed in into the model. And in this case, it's because of vertical misalignment. So similarly, if we look at this as another example, so here we are saying that with a probability of 0 0.95, we managed to predict correctly the right types of error that's responsible for causing a drift, which in this case is due to horizontal misalignment. So similar interpretation can be made here on the wax build up in the transducer support, where we actually managed to achieve 100% accuracy in predicting exactly where the wax build up and which location of the port. So from this example, and from the results from this case study, we can see that by using the machine learning algorithm, we can actually overcome the challenge that we have previously and actually identify what type of error is responsible for causing the drift occurs in the diagnostic variable. And these are performed by looking at um, different correlations between all the data points that we feed in into the model. So next, let's look at the second case study. So here we are now focusing on different types of flow meter, which is a Coriolis flow meter, and then here we're using another different types of model, which is a survival analysis model. So this type of model is commonly used when we want to predict the failure rate of a flow meter at a certain time period through advanced probability analysis. So this type of model is very useful in terms of um, in helping decision-making process because we can essentially estimate the remaining useful life of a flow meter. And that's what actually helps end users, you know, when will be a good time to replace or fix the flow meters. And you can an end user can even set a threshold onto the model and tell them, you know, if, it's, if, if the flow meters uh, remaining useful life ever fall below that threshold, it can then trigger an alarm to tell the end user to say that, oh, by the way, you should probably think of replacing it or fixing it. Another thing that you can do with a survival analysis model is that you can combine it with a regression model to analyze the impact of different factors such as temperature and flow rate on the failure rate of flow meters. So in other words, how will other factors speed up or slow down the failure rate of flow meters? So that may be of interest to end users uh, who they know that their, their, their flow meters is failing, but they want to find of ways you know, to slow down the failing process. So then they can maybe then look at other factors that they can maybe change or fix to you know, slow down the process. So in this case study, we want to predict the failure rate of a Coriolis meter when it's been exposed to sand erosion. So here are the results. So on the plot that's shown on your left-hand side, we have our, the survival probability um, simulation, 
where on the x-axis it basically shows you the number of hours of sine erosion and on the y-axis it's just survival probability going from zero to one. We have two different colors of line here representing two different types of Coriolis meters, meter A and meter B. And as you can see that as you increase the number of hours of erosion, the survival probability for both meters decreases, which obviously to be expected, as obviously sand erosion is causing some damage to the Coriolis meters. However, what's interesting to point out is that despite both of them being Coriolis meters, we can clearly tell from this graph that the performance of meter B is clearly better than the performance of meter A. So in this case, so this could probably be because of the design or the belt of the meter B that's making it more uh, resistance towards sand erosion. So if we look at this in detail, at, uh, say for example, at a erosion hour 150, we can say that the probability of meter A surviving is only around 12%. In other words, there's an 88% chance that meter A is going to completely fail at this time. Whereas in comparison, at this exact same erosion hour, the probability of meter B failing is only around 70%. In other words, it has a 30% chance of, um, sorry, the failing rate uh, of meter B failing is only around 30% chance. In other words, there's a 70% chance that meter B is going to survive. So it's very clear that meter B in this case performs a lot better. So then the next thing that we want to know is to say, well, how are other factors such as flow rate and temperature affect the failure rate of our Coriolis meters? So this is exactly what this is shown here. So we have different colors of line here representing different uh, flow rate ranging from 900 liters per minute all the way to 1,800 liters per minute. And you can see how we get different um, shapes of the line due to the different flow rate, which then is a clear indication that flow rate does have an impact on the failure rate of a Coriolis meters. So generally speaking, you can say that as you increase your flow rate, the survival rate of your Coriolis meters will also decrease. In other words, high flow rate will speed up the filling process of your Coriolis meters in this situation. So that sort of analysis is very helpful as it can actually indicate to end user, you know, the performance of your Coriolis meters under the uh, understanding erosion, which can then help you make better decisions and deciding, you know, when will be a good time to replace the um, flow meters. So hopefully from these two case studies, you kind of get a general idea on the advantage that you can actually obtain from using machine learning models or even different statistical models and analyzing data that's produced from flow meters. So to just uh, round off this webinar, I would just like to give you a little conclusion, a summary. So Dr. Lindsay at the start have mentioned about the digitalization of flow meters industry and as well as some of the challenges associated with it. I then go on to talk to about the different types of data-driven models that you can use, the type of result you expect to obtain from them and the associated benefit, and then detailed um, uh, result are then shown on two case studies where the first case study focused on the ultrasonic flow meters where we actually managed to obtain a high accuracy prediction on the types of error um, we are facing based on the correlation between different data. And then the second case study was on Coriolis flow meters where we then predict the meter failure rate when it's being exposed to sand erosion. So hopefully that um, everyone managed to get something out from this webinar and that you all find something um, useful from this. So if, once again, just like to say thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Gordon and Yansen. Um, if you could just bear with us for a couple of minutes uh, we're just going to pull up uh, some of the questions. I think we've maybe just got time for a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so do one of you want to yeah. take yeah. Yeah, 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 well, yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, well, that's a very interesting question that's popping up uh, on the screen asked by someone. It says that, um, in your experience, what is the most popular digital network in full measurement? So I think uh, Gordon will be the best person to answer this question. Yeah, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a good question. Um, but actually, from our experience, certainly we started uh, looking at digital flow meters about 10 years ago. Most, most commonly we see Modbus flow meters coming in. That's, generally I think that's because that gives people or manufacturers have a lot more flexibility with Modbus. You don't rely on particular types of hardware. Foundation field bus, you do get foundation field bus um, meters coming in as well, but with those types of meters, they're hard. They're, they're hardware relying. You have, you have to rely on um, power blocks and network spurs. Whereas Modbus just relies on a two-wire um, signal. And if you've got the the correct comms cards in your PC and you've got the right um, software that can translate that information, 
um, I can kind of I can understand why Modbus has become the prevalent one in, in flow measurement. That not, that's maybe that, that's just our opinion based on what we've seen going through our labs. That may not actually be the case, but certainly from our experience, we certainly see a lot more Modbus devices. I think what's interesting is over the past few years, um, it used to be a not so much a problem, but if we heard there was a Modbus job coming in, we go, oh no, it's a, it's a Modbus job. We've got to um, get Gordon or get one of the other guys to. Um, to set up the columns for that, whereas now um, everyone here is very confident in setting up a Modbus um, job because they're becoming much more common, because meters are coming in more regularly with these kind of outputs. So that, that in itself is an indication um, of how the industry is going, and certainly you get a lot more information out of, out of these devices. Um, you, you do get meters with proper buses as well, certain, um, and of course a lot of meters are actually um, made to order by the manufacturers to suit whatever kind of um, protocol that um, a particular factory or process plant is using. So. Um, again, that's just purely our experience based on, on what we see coming in. So hopefully that answers that, that question. It's a good question, thank you. Um, okay, uh, I've got one uh, for you. If you want, um, how about this one for you? Uh, how do you uh, decide which model to use? Quite a simple sounding question, but I imagine it's not that simple. Yeah. Uh, yep. Well, first of all, thank you for this question. It's actually a very interesting question. Uh, unfortunately, there's no straight answer to this because it really depending on what type of work you try to do. I just simply wanted to understand a little bit better of the data you have. Then in, the, in this case, it will be a regression model. But if you want to do forecast and prediction, then it will be a different type of model. And you will find that even under the same type of model, say like for a classification model, there's actually a different model that does the same job. So a lot of times you actually need to do a little bit of research and actually just try it, and then you can compare the performance between different uh, models. It also then depending on, you know, do you have any missing values in your data, which is quite common in, in the field of mo uh, data modeling. So uh, there will be certain models that's more suitable in handling missing data, and there will be other models that's completely unable to handle missing data. So there's a lot of factors that you need to consider when you're deciding which type of model to use. So normally when I try to start modeling, I always start off with a base model, a baseline model. So a lot of people, when they start modeling, they always go into the trap that, oh, because my, my question is very complicated, I'm going to start off with the most complicated model. Sometimes it doesn't work like that because sometimes the simplest model actually gives you the best result. So then I would advise to anyone who's starting, you know, in this field using data modeling, I will always start with a simple model and then work your way up. Adding more factors make it better, but don't always try to, you know, jump straight into a very complicated one. But that's a very interesting question. Thank you so much. Good, good answer as well, I'd say. Uh, <laughs> want to take one more question? Yeah, I think, uh, I think that one is a quite a good one. It's quite relevant. It says, uh, how many projects uh, are you currently handling? Well, I think that's another one for yeah, us as well. Yeah, the, the, the whole team, I, I suppose. So, yeah, at the moment, uh, Dr. Liang, uh, myself, and uh, Dr. Novak, who's uh, our data scientist, we're currently um, focusing on... Uh, three main projects. We're working on a, a government, U a UK government full program project, which is very much looking at condition-based calibration. We're, we're two years into that. We've done some experimentation. We've worked with manufacturers to get uh, data off of flow meters, and we're in the process of building a, a model. Uh, we've also got a couple of commercial projects um, on, on the go as well, which um, I can't go into too much detail again, but in, in, in general, um, it's big data analytics. It's, it's um, looking at field data and trying to uh, decipher interesting trends and patterns about uh, things like failure, failure rates, as you were talking about um, earlier. So yeah, um, basically it's a, it's a bit of a 50-50 split at the moment between uh, government research and, and commercial projects, but of course um, we're, we're always happy to, to take on more projects, so if there's anyone listening to this who wants, who wants to get in touch with us, with, then please feel free, and um, we'll happily chat to you about any data analytics you may, may need.